Hello, new life. It's time once again to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Scripture tells us many times to praise Almighty God. And it's not like God needed us to remind him of how great he is. I think God in his wisdom knew that his children, that we would need reminding. We forget so easily. But there is power in praise. And the word says that God inhabits the praises of his people. And I firmly believe and I have experienced that when we are wise enough to, to lift weary hands and burdened hearts to him, our God honors our praises and he does inhabit them. And the Holy Spirit can minister to us and bring us peace and strength. In just a moment, we're going to listen to a song called Raise a Hallelujah. This is a perfect opportunity for us to raise our praises to God. One of the lines says, I'm going to praise him in the middle of the storm. When we're in the middle of the storm, that is the perfect time to praise God. Usually when we feel like praising the least, that's when we really need to praise the most. And God is so faithful and so good to us. So let's get ready for um, a morning of praise and worship and listening to the word of God. And let's remember together that our help is in the name of the Lord, who made the heavens and the earth. <music>
Life Community Church, and thank you for joining us for another one of our messages and our series out of the book of Acts. We've been in this book for quite a few weeks now, and I don't know about you, but I've really been enjoying it. And we won't be doing Acts for that much longer, but we're not done quite yet. Today I'm bringing a word out of primarily the last chapter of Acts, which is chapter 28. And I'll be looking at the first half of the chapter, and this message will be titled, Right Here for a Reason. And we'll be diving into what that means. Our focus in this series has been Acts chapter 1, verse 8, which is where Jesus promises that they will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes, and that they will be witnesses for him, they being the first disciples and apostles. They will be witnesses for Jesus, starting in Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And the book of Acts shows the spread of the gospel, how the Christians spread out largely because of persecution, but mainly because of the Holy Spirit leading them. And an amazing example of that is the life of Paul the Apostle, who has led in many amazing and even some uncomfortable ways to preach the gospel in many places, not all of which he planned on going. So before we jump into chapter 28, Let's recap how Paul got where we are going to find him. Paul has been a prisoner since chapter 21, when he was arrested in Jerusalem. So since then, and you can go back and read that, he's not been traveling of his own free will entirely. Really, ever since he met Jesus on that road to Damascus, he's been following the will of Jesus over his own. But now, now he's arrested, and he's sort of moving wherever the people in charge of him are pulling him but God is really the one pulling the strings. In chapter 23, verse 11, this is a key verse that you can read. Jesus actually stands near Paul and appears to him saying, take courage as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. So Jesus makes a promise that Paul will testify, he will preach the gospel in Rome. And then in Acts chapter 25, there's another key verse that really seals Paul's fate and moves him in this direction. In chapter 25, Paul says these fateful words. He says, I appeal to Caesar. And because Paul, as a Roman citizen, appeals his case, what he's been accused of, uh, to Caesar, that means that he must go to Rome in order to make that appeal. And because Jesus has promised that Paul will get there, nothing, no matter how dangerous the hazards that he encounters may be, will stop him from getting to Rome in one piece. And that being said, Paul does go through a lot. He has a really rough journey. And in chapter 27, you can read right before we're about to pick up, Paul and his companions actually go through a shipwreck. And if you want to read about all of Paul's mishaps, you can hop over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and in the second half of that chapter, Paul gives a long list of all of the beatings and shipwrecks and persecutions and, and different obstacles that he encountered when he was traveling, spreading the gospel. So let's pick up now in Acts chapter 28. I'm going to start in verse 1. Once safely on shore, we, and this is Luke speaking, traveling with Paul, found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself to his, on his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, the goddess of justice has not allowed him to live. So get this image for a moment. Paul goes to build a fire on this island, and as he's putting wood on the fire, a snake is driven out by the heat and latches on to his hand. And these bystanders are watching, saying, oh my gosh, the gods must have determined that this guy is going to die. Like, what an unfortunate thing to happen to someone. So Paul's standing there with a snake hanging off of his hand. And then it says in verse 5, but Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. I just get this image of everyone watching Paul just waiting for him to keel over or fall down. And because of God's protection, he does not suffer any effect from the snake venom. 
And Paul, I'm sure, explained to them that he was not a god, but that it was God who was protecting him. And how is it that Paul survived something so miraculous? Well, the simple reason is Jesus promised that Paul would make it to Rome. If God has made you promises in your life that have not been fulfilled yet, you're not going to have anything happen to you that will take you from this life until those promises are fulfilled. So Paul is believing in that, and that's why he's really not phased by this snake. And then in verse 7, it says, There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him, and after prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies we needed. So Paul heals this man, and then the rest of the sick on the island come to him and receive healing also. So Paul is very much here for a reason. There's a great series a great message rather that Pastor Scott did, I believe two weeks back, and it's called How the Holy Spirit Leads Us. I really recommend looking at it because in that message, Pastor Scott shows a map on the screen and it shows how Paul is sort of blown off course, it seems, and and directed in the direction of Rome. And all these places that Paul is stopping along the way, even if it's the result of a shipwreck, or some mishap like that, it is not an accident. Paul is in these places for a reason. And that's really what the title of this message today is getting at, right here for a reason. Have you ever heard the phrase before, you are here for a reason? It's become sort of a cliche. It, it's sort of a, an encouraging statement that, that means that your life has meaning, that there's some purpose for you being here. And sometimes the way we take, it, take that is, well, you know, I'm alive for a reason. I guess maybe one day after a lot of waiting around, I'll, I'll find my purpose and I'll find where I'm supposed to be. But for, what, for right now, I just need to trust God and know that I'm here for a reason. I would really like to challenge us by taking that a step further and reminding us, including myself, that we are right here for a reason. Right now, in the very place that you are sitting or standing, the circumstances of your life right now, if you are a Christian, you can trust that God has allowed you to be here, that his Holy Spirit has led you to be here for a reason. It's not an accident, even if it feels like one. So let's resume in Acts chapter 28, verse 11. After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods Castor and Pollux, we put in at Syracuse and stayed there three days. From there, we set sail and arrived at Regium. The next day, the south wind came up, and on the following day, we reached uh, Putoli. That's a bit of a tough one, Putoli. Verse 14, there we found some brothers and sisters who invited us to spend a week with them, and so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters there had heard that we were coming, and they traveled as far as the Forum of Apius. And there were three taverns to meet us. And the three taverns to meet us. At the sight of these people, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. When we got to Rome, and here's a very key verse, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. So that's where we're going to stop in Acts 28 anyway, with Paul living by himself with a soldier to guard him. This would begin a period where Paul is now under house arrest. Uh, he's not in prison, he's not in some dirty dungeon, but he's not able to go wherever he pleases either. And up until this to this point, Paul has written some of the letters that we have in the Bible. Uh, before his permanent state of arrest, he had already written, we believe anyway, First and Second Corinthians, and also the book of Romans. So God led Paul through certain experiences that gave him the insight to write everything that we have in those books. And the same is true here. During this period of house arrest, this is when Paul would write several more books of the Bible, namely the books of Philippians, uh, Colossians, uh, Philemon, and Ephesians. He, he would write these books when he was under house arrest. And this is also part of the reason that Paul is right there at this time. With all this traveling and 
all this commotion that he's been through. It, it might have, must have been hard for Paul at certain points to just sit down and then pen a letter and really listen to what God was saying. But here, he's got nothing but time. Sounds kind of familiar to us after the past few months, doesn't it? Lots of time, lots of space, lots of solitude. And sometimes we do need that. As we know, there is a time and a place for it. When we're able to settle down from all the busyness and let the dust settle, thoughts sort of float to the surface. And then if we listen, we can hear God speaking to us. And certain things that he wants us to see and understand, they just become more clear to us. And that is part of the reason that Paul is right here under house arrest. It is so that he has the time and the space and the perspective to write many of the letters that we have in the New Testament. As the Holy Spirit leads him further and further away from the Jewish world, he writes these letters that have made their way to our world. And that is part of the reason that the Holy Spirit directed Paul through all these experiences. It's so he could write these letters that we still take encouragement from to this very day. I want to read real quick before we finish from one of those letters, and it's the book of Philippians. So really, what is the big reason that all this has happened to Paul? He tells us in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, and he says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result... It has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord, and I dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So he says that everything that has happened to him has served to advance the gospel, and that the result is that the very people that are watching him under house arrest are now hearing the gospel, and many of them are becoming Christians. Throughout all of Paul's journey, journeys, he had the opportunity to witness to jailers, to prisoners, soldiers, uh, judges, rulers, leaders, all of these people. And I really suggest that you read, if you get the chance, Acts chapter 21 through 28, just so you can see Paul's crazy journey since he ended up under arrest and all the people that God had him stand before and all the things that the Holy Spirit orchestrated. So Paul was right there in all of those places for a reason, and that reason is the gospel. As Christians, we believe that God has plans for us, as the Bible says, plans not to harm us, but to give us a future and a hope. And sometimes it's, it's confusing. It's hard to believe that when it does seem like we go through trials and difficulties and even harm. But really, it's not just selfishly for ourselves. It's not just God giving us a nice, easy life. Because let me tell you something. At the end of everyone's life, yours and mine, we're not going to wish that we made more money, that we worked harder. We're not going to wish that we had more happy days or just that we got to relax more. What we will really want at the end of our lives is to know that we invested in other people as much as we could. I really believe that, that the greatest fulfillment, that the greatest plans that God can make in our lives is giving us the opportunities to invest in other people. And the greatest way to make that investment is the gospel. There is no deeper gift, no greater thing you can impart to someone than to tell them the truth about Jesus if they do not already know. And when we look at Paul's life, Paul's life is full of this hope that someone like Paul, a murderer at first, someone who was killing Christians, who made so many wrong turns and could have lived with so much regret that his life could be turned around so much, that the beauty of the gospel is that we have peace with God after everything that we've done and that all of our sins have been forgiven. That's good news, that we don't have to live with regret anymore, that we do not have to live in fear about what happens after we die. This is the, the gift of the gospel, and this is the reason that we are right here right now. It's not just so we can have a good time and have a nice life, even though God does want to fill our, our lives with gifts and good things. It's really so that we can share the gospel with people, and that is the reason that you are right here in the season of life that you are right now. It's been a really crazy past few months, and we don't even know what the next few months are going to look like, but this truth will not change, that every situation that the Holy Spirit leads you into, you are right there in those places for a reason. 
And that reason will always be to give glory to God. Even if you're thinking right now, well, there's no one around that I can share the gospel with. I, I sort of work and live by myself. I guarantee you that, that part of the reason you are still here is because your life is giving glory to God. Even if there's no one around that you can share the gospel with, who knows, years from now, people might be sharing with others your story about what God did in your life. And even though it's not even coming from your mouth, God's goodness in your life could still be encouraging someone else that you may never meet. So God always gets the glory in our lives. And that glory turns people to him. And it turns people to him through the gospel, through the good news of Jesus Christ and what he did. That because of Jesus, we can know God and know that God loves us. And that the Holy Spirit leads us to these encounters with people where we can share that amazing truth. So remember, when you start to feel aimless or maybe that the place you're in is an accident, that you are right here, right now, for a reason. If you want to know what that is, spend some more time with the Holy Spirit. He'll show you what you're supposed to do next. Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for your leading. Thank you for... Thank you for being so intentional with us that we can know that every moment of our lives is important, that even if it feels wasted, there's something we can be doing with that time, even if it's just speaking with you and listening to you in silence and in solitude. Thank you so much for loving us and leading us and for giving us such an amazing responsibility that is not burdensome, but is rather a joyful thing, just to share with other people what you have done in our lives. As witnesses, we have seen you do amazing things, and all we need to do is share those stories of your goodness to us with other people. Thank you for giving us opportunities to do that because you love us as your children. We pray all this in your name, amen. And now, as you go forward into all the places that the Holy Spirit will lead you to be next, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace as you go in the leading of his Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. Go in peace.